Sometimes a long, relaxing drive can be fun. Picking out on gas station snacks, catching up on podcasts, seeing new sights along the road. That's a recipe for a good time. But on occasion, a long road trip brings you outside your comfort zone and into areas that might be haunted by dreadful things, like creeps, creatures, and things that can't be explained. Enjoy these allegedly true and scary road trip stories. Go to darkstories.org and send us your encounters to have them narrated. Check out eeriecast.com to listen to our other creepy podcasts. Now, let's begin. Cross Country from Spence Part 1. The Runners from the 80s to late 90s, I worked in the sales end for a printer company. Exciting, right? My job wasn't simple sales, though. It was corporate sales. This had me driving to different cities or states to meet with executives of companies to demonstrate our printers to convince them to use our printers throughout all their offices in the region. A successful sale meant a lot of money for the company. They provided me a company car and eventually a company credit card for flights and rental cars, but for several years I was required to drive. The company didn't want to pay for flights that frequent at the time, so for a while I would routinely drive nearly from coast to coast. I'm talking anywhere from 30 to 40 hour drives every month. I might have been paid for each of those hours, but I'll be darned if that much driving and alone time doesn't get to you. My constant road trips brought me across various sites and encounters, some of which have kept me on edge even now. At a certain point, it filled me with dread when I knew I'd be forced to drive through certain roads or regions because of what I had previously encountered there. On several occasions, I would find myself driving back and forth through endless miles of fields in Nebraska to demonstrate some model revisions to a company in Wyoming, a company my higher-ups thought were almost ready to buy but it ended up being a series of wasted trips after the company in question never made the switch to our products. But they really liked those demonstrations, I guess. Anyway, these had to be among the most boring drives I'd ever taken in my career. Much of it was just a straight drive with samey-looking fields for a couple of hours. And the drive back was the worst part. My schedule had me driving back through these fields after dark, which was somehow worse, I didn't like driving in the dark, and by then it was around 2 a.m., and it'd be another three hours before I could make it to a decent place to finally sleep, then get some early breakfast. So imagine my shock one night, when I was driving back after yet another failed sales meeting half asleep, when several silhouettes began to emerge on either side of my car, about half a dozen of them. Whatever they were, I saw them emerge from the stalks of vegetation that made up the fields. The stalks bent sharply, many breaking under the weight of these large silhouettes that then came forward and began to bound along the road, keeping pace with my car. I was driving about 40 miles per hour. I'd always been a stickler for obeying speed limits. But that's still pretty fast for an animal, right? Especially for a land animal in North America. I'd lived in cities and suburbs forever, but I knew about coyotes and even wolves in certain parts of North America. But these things, they didn't look like that. They didn't look right at all. And as I sped up, terrified, to 55 miles per hour trying to outrun them, they matched my speed without so much as a misstep. They never got directly in front of my headlights, so I didn't get a perfect look at them. But I did glance dozens of times from left to right, trying to get some kind of details. The first thing I noticed was that these creatures' shoulders were two to three times taller and more broad than their hips. Their front legs looked far and away more powerful than their back legs. Their shoulders were their highest points, with the head tucked a few inches lower. That being said, their shoulders came up to the halfway point of my side window which I think would have been about four and a half feet. I could see floppy ears atop their low heads, as well as extremely long snouts. That was probably the weirdest part. Take the snout of a greyhound and double it in length. 
It was like crocodile proportions. Well, I kept driving along, heart pounding, turning the radio up as I now sped up to 60. Only when the speed approached 65 did I finally start to see these creatures lag behind, but it was steady. When I heard the scratch tear along the passenger side door, I shouted a curse. One of those things had attacked the car. That convinced me to flatten the accelerator. I must have hit 90 going down that road, and I didn't stop even after the silhouettes lagged behind and disappeared into the darkness and fields behind me. I sped all the way to the first gas station I could find, absolutely grateful that a cop didn't pull me over along the way. The memory of the trouble I got in when I got back to the office with the company car is just as vivid. I tried to explain that some animal had swiped at my car after coming out of the fields, but they still deducted the damage for my next check and warned me that if it happened again, I'd be using my own car for a while. A few months after that, I had to go back to that same company for yet another demonstration. That first run-in with those creatures was fresh on my mind. So when I took the day trip through Nebraska on my way to Wyoming, I was terribly on edge as I passed through those fields. Luckily, nothing happened, but I'm afraid my anxiety about passing through on my way back after dark got the better of me during the demo. I ended up stuttering a bit when I hadn't messed up my presentations in ages, not since I was new to the demo meetings. After the usual we will call you from the execs after the demo, I got back in my car and sighed. Did I really have to drive back through there? I wondered. I began to brainstorm alternate paths, but I wasn't very familiar with the surrounding roads and detours. And if I got myself lost, I'd get back later than expected with the company car and I might lose it. If I was forced to take my own car, my clunker back at home, I couldn't really afford all that gas for these trips at the time. I resolved to just get it over with. I told myself the first sign of nonsense out in those fields, I would just speed right up to 90. Police or speeding tickets be darned. I made my way back to and through Nebraska. My stomach was doing flips, and admittedly I was getting gassy which usually did happen to me when I got severe anxiety. I just wanted the trip through Nebraska to be done. Soon I was driving through those quiet, almost motionless fields. For a while, nothing happened. Everything seemed normal. I wished my visibility was better as there was a new moon that night, but everything was going smoothly otherwise. Then I saw it. Instead of speeding up, I found myself slowing down, I was flabbergasted. It was one of those things, those runners. It stood on the right side of the road, between the asphalt and the fields. It was focused on something below it, tearing into it the way a dog would, one especially massive paw on the carcass while pulling at the meat with its mouth. The creature it was eating appeared to be smaller with some dark fur and some light fur. Probably a possum. As I got closer to it, it calmly turned and looked at my car. It was the first time I'd seen one of these things right in front of my headlights. It looked like a mutated collie. Extra long snout as I described before, long but messy hair and floppy ears. But it all had a collie sort of look to it. It didn't look menacing like it seemed the first time. I watched it lick its mouth like a dog who had been distracted from his kibbles. It didn't seem angry or bothered, it sort of just looked at me. It appeared to be around 400 pounds, that's how big it was. I remember shaking my head and wondering if this really was the same thing I'd seen before. The shoulders were broad and the hips were thinner, the snout was unusually long, it had to be the same creature. I pressed down on the accelerator reminding myself that one of these things had in fact clawed the door last time, meaning that if I hadn't been in a car, it might have wanted to eat me. As my speed climbed to around 50 miles per hour, I began to see more of them on the side of the road. Like large dogs, they were sleeping on their sides. One was panting and lying down. It watched me as I passed through. All this was so bizarre, 
seeing something so weird looking, acting so typical. My heart rate rose even still, and I drove on out of there, only realizing I'd sped up to 90 miles per hour again when I began to see the lights of civilization ahead. I couldn't stop thinking, if these things were so nonchalant about hanging out on the side of the road, I couldn't have been the only person to ever see them, right? Part 2. Touched Long before the encounter with those runners put the fear of the nighttime road in me, I'd been keen to nap at truck stops when my eyes got too heavy, and accommodation was few and far between. On a particular trip, I was driving through Missouri when I stopped at a payphone to call in and check with my boss. I think the call was to ask if I could swap one of the models out in the demo with an older one, as that newer model kept jamming. But my boss was happy I called because they'd received a call not too long ago about the demo being cancelled. My boss was noticeably upset on the phone because cancelling something like this cost them money. As for me, I didn't mind. It was less for me to do, and I was still getting paid to turn around and drive back. Sadly, though, I was too far from home to drive back without rest. I ended up stopping at a truck stop, one of those oddly big ones with a fast food chicken joint built into the side, and at least 20 types of beef jerky on sale at the counter. I got the gas refilled, bought some coffee and beef jerky, then found a nice spot away from the customer lot to rest. You might be wondering why I got coffee if I was about to sleep, but coffee had always made me more tired if I drank it afternoon. I don't know why. After my snack, I turned on the AC and adjusted the radio to some late night talk show. I crawled in the back where there was more room to lay down, and I lowered the window closest to my feet, letting my feet sit and hang on the open window sill. I've always had trouble cooling down and the night was cooler than my AC, so I thought having the window down would help me get cool and let me accommodate my full length. After some time, I fell asleep. I can't say it was very good sleep. I'm a big snorer, and I ended up snoring myself awake at some point. As one usually does after waking up in the middle of the night, I was about to readjust myself to get more comfortable, when I suddenly felt some resistance at my feet. I looked down at my feet hanging at the window, and I stopped breathing for a moment. I saw a large man's hand, pale and veiny with bitten nails, loosely holding on to my left foot. It was motionless. Whoever it belonged to seemed to be crouched down as the arm went downward below the window. For the next several minutes, I sat there, staring at the hand and thinking to myself, this can't be freaking real. Who the heck is grabbing me in the middle of the night at a truck stop? I pumped myself up. I figured some homeless person might have been trying to get my attention and perhaps they'd passed out near my car. Gathering my courage, in a split second I shot straight over to the window and I looked down. The ground was bare. My heart began to pound. I'd sat there for several minutes staring at what was clearly and unmistakably a hand which I could clearly feel on my foot, and yet, it was gone. The owner of the hand was nowhere to be seen. I jumped out of the car then and went prone on the ground, searching the underside of the car. Nothing. No one was there. I stood up and looked everywhere in the distance. There was only one other vehicle here in this lot, a semi-truck, and it was parked too far from me for me to have not seen someone run over there to hide. Now wide awake, I circled my car and practically jumped back in, carrying on my merry way back home, on what was probably less than half an hour of sleep. Paranormal Experiences From Pokemon Yo One summer, my friends and I spent a lot of time traveling to various spots known to be very haunted across the St. Louis, Missouri region. One night we took the Ouija board to Main Street in St. Charles, Missouri. A city founded in 1769, it was the first state capital of Missouri, and it's situated on the Missouri River. We used it there for several hours. Some strange things happened while using the Ouija, such as very old perfume smells, some movement and responses on the board with the planchette, 
and gusts of wind, but nothing really paranormal. Until we were getting ready to leave. Prior to leaving, we were talking and standing by our cars. Then, directly across the street from me, I saw a tall woman in white, frantically running across the street in an 1800s era dress. She was transparent, bright, white, and quickly vanished. If I blinked my eyes, I would have missed her. That's how fast she ran and vanished. I looked at my friend and said, Did you just see... And he basically said, The lady in the white dress run across the street? He validated what I saw without even having to say it. There are several stories of the Lady in White in St. Charles that can be found online. According to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Lady in White reportedly haunts the 400 block of South Main Street in St. Charles, sulking behind the buildings where no one ventures after dusk. The 400 block of South Main Street is the exact location where we saw her, literally on the dot. We all left Main Street around 3 a.m., and drove over to the St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Cemetery. My friend parked his car, I rode with him, and as a group with our other friends, who separately drove their own cars, we all walked into the cemetery to try to experience more and hopefully catch some evidence. Eventually, a cop pulled up in his car, then walked up and asked us what we were doing. We told him we were ghost hunting. He was super cool about it and said, I've got something to show you. Come with me. He took us over to Jean-Baptiste Pointusabel's grave and explained who he was, the founder of Chicago. He told us some of the stories and how the area is known to be super haunted. Louis Blanchet, the founder of the city of St. Charles, is buried there too. We spent a few more minutes there. Then afterwards, we went back to my friend's car. His mileage read at the time, 666. This experience led to me and the same friend spending a lot of time at his house, conducting EVPs, basically using multiple voice recorders to capture audio, taking pictures and recording video, using MEL and EMF meters, as well as a PSB7 spirit box, REM pod, along with consistently using the Ouija board and conducting seances asking for things to happen or things to show themselves to us. We were very dedicated and serious about it, there are too many things we experienced at his house to list. Here's some of them, though. The following are three separate EVP sessions we had that took place in the same room of the house. The first session. We were sitting in his room during an EVP session recording the audio, asking for the entity to make a noise, to show itself to us. All of a sudden, his tall lamp falls over in the corner. We were sitting away from it. No one had touched it. My friend ran out of the room and I jumped over the bed and clipped my leg on it. I had to get it bandaged. We went back and listened to the audio. A voice appeared on the recording. Visually looking at the audio, we could see a blip. It was at a much lower frequency and volume than our voices. We could hear the response but decided to increase the volume of the audio. And the voice said, Wait, wait just before the lamp fell over. From what I gather, it was telling us it was about to do something prior to doing it, sort of like a countdown. For example, wait, wait, okay now. The second session. As we listened back to the second recording session, there was a voice that specifically said my friend's name, then my name. We quickly went downstairs and told his older brother. I exported the audio and emailed it to him. His brother opened it up, played the audio file for us out loud on the TV from a different room. The recording said my friend's name, then my name, like it originally did when we played it back. But, the brother played the audio over again, and this time, it included the brother's name in the recording. His brother's eyes immediately teared up, he was visibly shaken, and he told us to get out of his room. I'm not sure how this was even possible. I've thought about electronic glitches, but it was a scary moment that an audio file already exported from one device and shared to a different device could be altered in real time as we listened to it together. Third session. We received an intelligent response to a direct question we asked. We asked how old the entity was and he specifically responded his age. 
18. Again, looking at the audio, there was a small blip where the entity responded, and it was on a much lower frequency and volume than our voices. Items and objects moving and disappearing was a somewhat common occurrence in his home, and even in my home. Here are a couple of examples. In my friend's house, while we were watching something on TV, there was a coin that fell off his dresser in his room. It caught our attention, so we went looking for it. When we found it a few minutes later, it was in a closed dresser drawer. At my house, my friend wasn't with me at the time. While I was sitting in a room near the kitchen, I heard a dish break out of nowhere. I went in the kitchen and noticed that for the dish to have broken, it would have needed to be lifted up from the dish rack, since there are sides or walls around the edge of it, and moved over two feet, then dropped directly into the sink. There was nothing in the sink before it happened. The dishes were already cleaned. If it simply fell into the sink, which it couldn't have, it would have landed in the left side of the sink, but instead it was in the right side. We continued to actively seek paranormal experiences, asking for entities to show themselves, even though we already 100% believed in it and had these prior experiences. We wanted more and more, which leads to the most profound experience I've had. It was approaching midnight on a snowy and icy winter night in December. My friend and I were driving back to my place, and as we came up on a crossroads, less than a quarter mile ahead of us, we noticed a man in dark, dirty clothes, carrying a dirty bag over his shoulder, resembling a very old man. He had a limp, and as he walked, it was kind of glitchy looking, and did not look normal. He was walking along the side of the road towards the crossroads, with his back to us as we approached him. Immediately, my friend and I thought it was unordinary. We looked at each other and said, What the heck? As we've always traveled this road, many, many times, and had never seen someone walking on it, especially during winter, at midnight. Our first thought was it could be a homeless man. I seriously considered rolling down the window and asking if he was okay, but that thought quickly changed as we approached him. As we passed alongside him, I looked over my shoulder, directly looking at his face. Nothingness. His face was pitch black. Then I looked at his hands, and they were also pitch black. And I don't mean like he was wearing a dark ski mask and gloves. Additionally, he was not transparent, like most apparitions are. He actually completely resembled a human in appearance and apparel, except for the face and hands. My friend and I quickly drove to the other side of the crossroads and immediately whipped the car around to get another view of him. But by then, he was gone. But hundreds of feet back where we just came from, we saw an entity cross the road and then vanish under a light post. So we drove down the road and back multiple times, no one to be found. When we decided to finally go back home, we had to turn around in a court, and a big black dog was on the side of the road, staring at us as we drove by. A few minutes after that, a rabbit ran out right in front of us, causing us to frantically slam on the brakes. This experience occurred at a crossroads near a Catholic church, a few days later, we decided to visit the church and see if they had any familiarity with such stories or sightings, but no one answered the door, although several cars were there. Then we visited a second Catholic church in the area, and as we were walking through the grass toward one of the buildings, a black cat walks up beside my friend and I, stares at us, then continues walking on. Well, guess what? This church did not answer their door for us either. I want to mention I don't believe in the black cat superstition, and I felt zero negative or evil energy from the cat. The cat was awesome and just looked at us before moving onward. All of this still gives me goosebumps today, and it happened many years back. For a while now, I've been looking for more clarity, explanation, and to better understand all of it. We sought it and found it, but there aren't many answers. What's your take on all these experiences? What do you think it means? And most importantly, who was the entity we saw at the crossroads? What would have caused him to appear to us that night? No one else was around the entire time it happened. Not one car, one person, nothing. 
Ride Home from Florida From Jade Speedster, 1718 Two summers ago, we went out to Florida to visit my aunt and try out the Universal Studios Park. And yeah, it was fun. Sadly, two of the rides were down, which isn't anything new as it seems the rocket is always down for maintenance. But it was a fun trip. We didn't stay long. My mom had to work, money can be an issue, and my aunt is in the Navy. So we packed up after three days and headed home, which is a long car ride. We live in Virginia. For context, that can be about a two-day car ride if you don't like driving for 12 hours. We left around 10 or 11 a.m. and did not get home until after 2 a.m. Now, our GPS normally takes us on the quickest route home, which, if you've used Google Maps, can be on some weird back roads, curvy roads, or just in areas where you lose signal for an hour or so. This is how we came in on highways and would leave on state roads. Hardly a car in sight on these roads in the middle of nowhere, all through Georgia and the Carolinas. Well, it was late, going on past midnight. We were a few hours out from our home state, I was positioned near the far left of the truck, staring out the tinted windows. I could see a large building outside the window, assuming we were near a small town or a city. My sisters were both asleep, and my mom dozed off in the front seat, my dad driving. Suddenly ahead, we saw the flash of blue and red lights of cop cars. My dad was curious as to what was up, as it was so late and we were on a deserted back road. I look out my window to see some dogs, cops with flashlights walking up and down the road. Things were almost in slow motion as we drove by. I watched them, and I saw a large van that looked to be a hospital ambulance. They seemed to be searching for something. Then, a ways up after that, I see something else in the dark on the side of the road. Now remember, the windows are tinted glass, so I couldn't make out much but I could tell this person was tall, hunched over slightly, and walking with elongated, almost stiff-legged steps with their hands behind their back. They seemed to have robes on, like a hospital gown, and I think they were completely bald at that. They had no pants on, and I could see the back end open where their rear would be, which is why I think it was a hospital gown. They also had no flashlight or anything like the other cops had, we drove by what felt like to me in slow motion, but soon my dad seemed to pick up the pace of the car. I looked in the front seat at my mom and stepdad. They were looking at each other, just as confused as I was. My mom even admitted it was kind of creepy. For someone to be out this late, much less after all the cops we saw looking for something with dogs, it was suspicious. I wonder if that person I saw might have been an escaped mental asylum patient. Maybe they took advantage of an accident to escape. I'm not sure. All I know is that I was kind of uncomfortable, given we were the only ones on the road at the time. My stepdad later told me he had a bad feeling about the whole situation, which was why he pushed the speed limit leaving. I tried later to look something up about it, but never did find anything about it or anything like it of recent events. I tell people about it still as a joking story when we bring up creepy experiences. However, to this day, I'm still not sure what it was all about, and somehow I'm fine with that. Keep an eye on the road. From Darla T. While this was an extremely quick experience, it was the scariest thing I've ever had happen to me. My mom, dad, my sister, and I were coming back from Florida. We lived in Louisiana and had taken a trip to Florida for some vacation time with the family. The road trip back was only four hours, not so bad. But we were driving at night, around midnight. My sister and I were in the back seat, trying to get some rest. My mom, who was supposed to be keeping my dad company, was failing miserably, because I think everyone was just tired. I remember there was some woods on the left side of the road, on the right a barbed wire fence and some fields beyond it. I was about to doze off when my mom started to say something along the lines of, Gary, Gary do you see that Gary? It happened so fast, both my sister and I woke up, looking straight ahead through the windshield. I think all four of us began screaming at the same time, 
It started out as a silhouette, but as we were going about 40 or 45 miles per hour on a half moon night, we didn't fully grasp what we were looking at until we basically hit it. This silhouette grew closer as we drove towards it. My dad, I guess not aware of this silhouette, just kept driving. By the time the front bumper of the car touched the silhouette, we all watched, screaming, as the silhouette passed through the bumper. In moments, it was passing through the windshield as well. In the blink of an eye, the silhouette was in the car with us. It looked like a woman screaming, and as it entered the windshield, we heard her scream, and we screamed along with her. I've never felt such terror and chills for that brief moment, and it was all over so fast as our vehicle passed through her completely. When we drove through her, my dad slammed on the brakes, confused and terrified that he may have hit someone, even though clearly the thing went through the car. I stared through the back window and saw nothing behind us. It had vanished without a trace. Dad even got out of the car with a flashlight and looked around the road for a while, but he couldn't find anything. The entire ride home after that, my dad was upset, still thinking he had hit someone and couldn't find them. But me, my mom, and sister all told him that that was a ghost, some spirit. People don't just go through cars and vanish. My dad, being a paranoid person, ended up calling 911 about that road, and he checked up on the event, and they never found anyone there. It's been something like 20 years since then, and that's the memory I have. It's vivid, but I still might be missing some details. I was in my early teens, and I nearly had a heart attack.